Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, reading through verse number 9, I read as always from the King James text. Acts 1, 1 through 9. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach <clears throat> until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld... He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. If you'll bow your heads with me a moment again. Lord Jesus, Savior, King, Redeemer, we love you, Lord, today. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the presence of the Lord that we have felt in this place today. My, how wonderful it is to sing the old songs of Zion. How wonderful it is to sing the old hymns of the church. We celebrate so many important truths of our faith as we sing. You are the Lord of glory. You are the great I am, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Master, today we're grateful for the revelation of our God. We're grateful today, Lord, that we understand just exactly who you are. The word of God must now go forth. You've given the preacher a message for the church. You laid it in my spirit this week. And Master, now I need the divine assistance of the Holy Ghost like I've never needed the divine assistance of God before. If I'm to deliver this word, and it is to be effective in communicating to the people of God the truth that you would have me to communicate. Touch my feeble body, touch my mind, my lips, my heart. Help me, O oh God, at this moment to be your oracle that I might present a word to the people of God that is uh, beneficial and a blessing and encouragement and a help. Let our faith today grow and multiply as the word of God is imparted not only in our hearing, but Lord, to our very spirit. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. 
I'm always over and over again repeating the truth in this church and in this ministry. Scripture answers Scripture. Mm -hmm. Too many preachers, Christians, and even denominations are in the habit of defining biblical terms according to their own imaginations and theological leanings. In doing so, they wind up preaching as absolute truth, things which are not, in fact, scriptural. Oftentimes, they're not accurate at all. Such is the case with the Lord's promise in Acts chapter 1 uh, to endue his people with power from on high. All my life I have heard it preached that the Holy Ghost baptism enables and empowers us to live holy and to avoid sin. But is this in fact what the Word of God is telling us? Is this in fact what the Lord was promising us in Acts chapter 1? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord made a clear promise. He said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. <coughs> and ye shall be perfect and sinless. No. And ye shall be holy and righteous. No. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Meaning, you will be witnesses of me. You will witness and testify to me. Listen. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, all of the Jewish territories, all of the Jewish world, and in Samaria, so the circle kept getting bigger and bigger. Jerusalem is the heart of Judea. It's the heart of the Jewish world. Then you have all of Judea, that's all of Israel. Then Samaria, which is on the outskirts of that. And then he said, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. My whole life I've heard it preach. See, Pentecostal church comes from a Methodist or a Wesleyan theological background. The holiness movement that preceded the Pentecostal movement was based on the teachings of John Wesley. John Wesley was a preacher, and I certainly believe he was well-intentioned, and I believe he meant well. You see, back in his day, there had uh, grown a movement of people behaving in ways that were very ungodly and very unrighteous, and it was very common, you know, I'm going to talk real plain English today. Whorehouses and houses of ill repute became very popular during that time. And alcoholism was rampant. Drunkenness was rampant. People were using alcohol to excess all over the place. And John Wesley came along and he decided based on his reading of scripture that God's people were supposed to live godly lives and holy lives and they were not to be caught up in this kind of behavior and in these sort of things. And certainly he was right. But from that movement grew a movement that began to read the Word of God from the uh, mindset of a book of law. Suddenly, instead of the gospel being a message of faith and grace, suddenly the gospel became a matter of law. You must do this, you mustn't do that. You have to do this, you cannot do that. You should do this, you should not do that. And suddenly the movement began to swell and it began to grow and they began to create these expanded lists of do's and don'ts. 
all of a sudden we have people being told how long the women's dresses should be and how short the man's hair should be. And we're being told uh, that women are not to wear jewelry and women are not to wear makeup and all these rules and regulations. And the worst part of it is all of these things were presented as heaven or hell issues. Why, if a woman claims to be a Christian but she wears makeup, she's going to hell because she's worldly. She's going to hell because she's not holy. That's not what the Bible says. I don't care how you try to twist it and pervert it. I don't care how you try to mess it up. That is not what the Bible says. And someone out there says, I don't, but the scripture says in this one place, you know, this is how women, holy women conduct themselves. Exactly. Exactly, but it doesn't say if you don't conduct yourself that way, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. You see, it's easy to read into it extra, but it's hard to simply let the Word of God say what the Word of God says and not then try to make it say more. Well, when you have a movement that teaches you that you must do all this list of things in order to make heaven, then all of a sudden that... Movement informs their interpretation of Scripture. Listen to me. Rather than the interpretation of Scripture being, excuse me, the movement being informed by the interpretation of Scripture. See, you got the, you got the tail wagging the dog. You got everything backwards. You got the cart in front of the horse. All of a sudden now, your theology and your mindset and your viewpoint begins to inform every passage you read. All of a sudden, every passage you read, you read through the lens of all these preconceived doctrines and all these preconceived notions. When the Pentecostal movement began and the Spirit of the Lord began to fall, in the early part of the uh, 1900s. And all over the world, people began to experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial biblical evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. The same identical experience that uh, the apostles and some 100, at least 108 other people experienced in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. When this movement began to sweep across the face of our planet and God began to make himself real in a brand new way, filling souls with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, people pointed to Acts 1 and 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Oh, hallelujah! God has promised us power! Yeah, but my question today is power? To what end? Okay, God gives us power. What kind of power? What's the power for? What does the power do? See, that's where the problem comes, because now, depending on what denomination you're in, depending on what organization you're part of, depending on what creed or what statement of faith you embrace, that's going to inform how you read the word power. That's going to inform what power means to you. Well, the Pentecostal holiness movement, when the Lord said you shall receive power, I grew up being told that means power to live holy. That means power to live above sin. That means power to live godly. So in other words, if you've got the Holy Ghost, you pretty much don't have any excuse in the world for not doing everything right, living everything right, saying everything right. That's the way I grew up. And then as the years went by, I, like so many other people, began to become a little bit disillusioned because guess what? I had the Holy Ghost. I know I've got the Holy Ghost, but I'm still able to cuss. I'm still able to lose my temper. I'm still able to say things ought not to say. I'm still able to do things ought not to do. Hello now. I'm still not 
one step below translation. I'm still not just that far away from being perfect and holy like I'm going to be in heaven. So what went wrong? I don't know how many people have literally come to believe the enemy has convinced them that the Holy Ghost baptism is not real. It is not authentic. And do you know why he's been able to convince them of that? Because the teaching they got was wrong. If you're convinced that this experience is going to bring about this end result, and that experience comes, but the end result that you were promised is not what happens, then you begin to question the experience. You begin to say, well now, I received the Holy Ghost. I spoke with other tongues. I thought I spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave me the utterance. But then I still sometimes get angry and lose my temper. I still say things I shouldn't say. I still do things I shouldn't do. My humanity still manifests itself on a regular basis. I was told that this was power to live holy and to live godly. But I'm not experiencing power to live holy and to live godly. So I must not have gotten what I thought I got. I must not have received the baptism of, oh no, honey, you got the Holy Ghost, but with the Holy Ghost, you got some very bad teaching. The truth of this experience, the truth of the power that the Lord promised the church would come on the day of Pentecost is actually contained within the promise itself. The Lord said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He then says, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So what does that tell you? I'll tell you what it tells you. It tells you that the end or the purpose of the power is to help you be a witness. What are you a witness to? What are you a witness of? Well, most of us weren't alive when Jesus walked the earth. Most of us weren't here. There's a couple of us might have been. But most of us wasn't here when the Lord rose from the dead and came out of the tomb. Most of us weren't here on the day of Pentecost. What are we going to be witnesses to? I'll tell you what we're going to be witnesses to. We are going to be witnesses to the resurrected Christ. We are living witnesses. What does that mean? That means that Jesus the Christ who rose from the dead three days after being buried in a borrowed tomb now lives and walks and breathes among men today. Still, he is not physically here. We do not see him with our naked eye. But by reason of his spirit dwelling in his people, he is still here. Hallelujah. And every believer has been empowered by his spirit, listen to me now, to demonstrate his power. Hallelujah. It's not your power. God his power. No, God manifests his own power through you and I. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the medium whereby God is able, listen to me, to bear witness to the resurrection of Christ in us and through us by demonstrating through us that he lives. Hallelujah. When the Word of God tells us that believers were first called Christians, the very first time that God's people were referred to as Christians in the Scriptures, when you look at it, you find out that the word Christian that is used in the Greek literally means, in essence, a duplicate an identical copy, a clone. 
The simplest definition from the word Christian is this, Christ-like. You see, the believers did not call themselves Christians. No. The Word of God says, I believe it was Ephesus, the Word of God said that it was the people in the community, it was the people in uh, the society who were observing these believers on the Lord Jesus Christ who had received the gift of the Holy Ghost and they said, well, these people are Christians. They used the term, not the believers themselves. What did they mean? They said, these people are Christ-like. These people are duplicates. These people are clones. These people look just like Jesus Christ. How do they look just like Jesus Christ? The power of Jesus Christ was operating in them and through them. God was still healing the sick through the church. God was still raising the dead through the church. God was still cleansing the lepers through the church. God was still delivering de demoniacs through the church. So they said, these people look just like Jesus. They act like Jesus. They behave like Jesus. They're little mini Jesuses. That's what the word Christian literally means. We've got so-called believers in our world today who love to run around and label themselves Christians. How many people love to profess that they are Christians and yet according to a biblical definition of the word Christian, they're anything but. Mm -hmm. Honey, if you don't look like Jesus, if you don't act like Jesus, if you're not operating in the same power that Jesus Christ operated in, you're not a Christian. You can call yourself a Christian all you want to. You can call yourself a tomato or a watermelon. I don't care what you call yourself. If you're not operating in the power of God and demonstrating the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, if people cannot look at you and say, hmm, he reminds me an awful lot of Jesus, then you're no more a Christian than that wall. Hmm. Listen, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Scripture answers Scripture. We've got to get out of the habit of trying to define terms based on our own theological leanings and our own prejudices. No, the power that the Lord promised the church had nothing to do with it's going to be power to help you live right and power to help you avoid sin and power to help you overcome blah, blah, blah. That is not what he promised. He promised power that was going to help us serve as witnesses to his resurrection. But what end that power. To what end that power? What does that power accomplish in us and through us? Look at Matthew 10 and 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, listen, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. In Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, the end that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. Mark 6 and 7, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Luke 9 and 1, Then he called his twelve disciples together, and gave them power, 
power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. But of God. Acts 4.33 And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Did you hear that? This is in Acts. This is after the Lord's ascended. And with great power gave the apostles witness of what? Of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Oh, Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then what? And ye shall be what? Witnesses. Acts 4.33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Doesn't that fit right in with Acts 1 and 8? Absolutely it does. That's the end. That is the end to which we receive power from God through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is power to be a witness, to be a testimony to the living, breathing, reigning Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Acts chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, listen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Doesn't say Stephen full of power lived a holy life and didn't drink and didn't dip and didn't smoke and didn't do drugs and didn't hire hookers and didn't do all the things he wasn't supposed to do. No! The power is there to enable us to bear witness to a living Christ. Hallelujah! And we are witness to a living Christ because we're allowing him to operate and manifest himself to the world through us. Acts chapter 8, verses 18 and 19. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Listen, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Romans 15, 18 and 19. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Listen to what Paul says. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto I, uh, I, Rickham, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So what does Paul say? He said, 
How was I able to reach the Gentile world? How was I able to bring the Gentile world into faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ? He said, did I do it by word? Did I do it only by reason of what I said and did? He said, no, no, no. It was through the power, the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. What makes believers, what causes people to reconsider and think that maybe this man Jesus was more than just a historical figure who walked planet earth 2,000 years ago. What makes people reconsider that, what makes people rethink that is when they see that this same Jesus is still doing today the things he used to do back when he walked on the earth, but now he does it through his people by his spirit. Why? Because we have received power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon us. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. But, listen carefully, but... In demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see where power, to what end power? What Lord power for what? power to be a witness so that your faith will not stand in the wisdom of men. It doesn't have anything to do with words and how well someone's are able to articulate the gospel. No, it's in the power of God. You have seen with your own eyes that God is real. God has demonstrated himself. God has made himself real right in front of your face. You believe in a resurrected Christ because Christ has made himself real through the church or at least that's how it's supposed to be that's not how it is not in every denomination not in every group not in every congregation but that's how it's supposed to be first corinthians 4 verse 18 now some are puffed up as though i would not come to you but I will come to you shortly, the Apostle Paul wrote, if the Lord will and will know not the speech of them that are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This is speaking of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. He said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, meaning in our bodies. He said that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So see, the power that we receive, and God doesn't impart his power to us, but he manifests and demonstrates his own power through us because now he is living in us. Hallelujah. And he is living through us. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. We are endued with power over demons and disease as a witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The Holy Ghost works through us to help us effectively witness to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do not just preach that Christ is risen from the dead. We demonstrate that Christ is risen from the dead. We do not just say he lives, but by his power in us, we demonstrate and show that he lives. Hallelujah. So many spirit-filled believers have been falsely convinced that the power of the Holy Ghost is meant to make them sinless and perfect. When they falter or when they fail, they come to doubt their experience as they do not seem to be experiencing the supposed benefits of the Holy Ghost in filling. But at the same time, many believers fall victim to false teaching concerning such things, listen to me now, as curses and generational curses and hexes, all because they have the truth of the purpose of the Holy Ghost baptism all mixed up in their thinking. So while they got it in their head that the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost is there to help me live perfect and help me live right, and that ain't happening. Well, you, your, your beliefs are all wrong. Your teaching's bad. Your teaching's all wrong. At the same time as they're believing this, they're believing that somebody can curse them and a witch can hex them. And they are subject to curses and hexes and generational curses. All these lies over here, which guess what? That's the stuff God gave us power over. So while you're thinking the power is supposed to be to this end, in reality it's to this end. So while on this end you're losing the battle, on this end you're losing the battle. Why? Because you got your beliefs all mixed up. You got everything backwards. I try to tell people all the time, especially those who come from the African continent. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're watching me right now, and you come from the African continent, the teaching that comes out of Africa is wrong, 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 wrong. The foolishness about generational curses, the foolishness about curses. The Word of God tells us that an undeserved curse falls to the ground. An undeserved curse. But not everybody can be cursed. Not everybody can be hexed. Not everybody is subject to these things. Jesus said he would give us power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us. Power to be a witness. He, he, he describes throughout the New Testament that the power that the Lord demonstrated, that the power that he gave his apostles was power over, what did he say? I give you power to tread upon serpents and over every deadly thing. He said over all the power of the devil and nothing Nothing, 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 nothing shall by any means harm you. <laughs> but we got people believing. Oh, this witch put a curse on me. Oh, this witch put a curse on me. Oh, this one hexed me. Believers who claim to be full of the Holy Ghost, they don't understand. No, honey, the power that God gave you makes you impervious to those things. Let them try to curse me. Let them try to hex me. Let them try to touch me. Honey, I'm a spirit-filled, born-again, tongue-talking, fire-baptized child of God, and the, all the hexes and all the curses in the world cannot touch me. And when you understand that, then you're able to walk and live in victory over the works of darkness, over the things of the enemy. You're able to walk in victory over those things because you understand. They, there's, that devil has no authority to visit any kind of a curse on my life. That devil has no authority to visit any kind of, of a hex on my life. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Think Jesus ran around worrying about who was hexing him? 
that Jesus ran around worrying about who was cursing him? Where in the scriptures do you ever see the disciples coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, Lord, this witch hexed us. Lord, this witch put a curse on us. You never see it. But you see Jesus telling his disciples, I give you power over every unclean thing, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Oh, hallelujah. When you understand the power of God that is manifest in our life through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is the power to walk as the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power to walk in His power and in His might. The Word of God said, be strong in the Lord, listen, and in the power of what? His might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The Word of God said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Oh, all of a sudden, the picture begins to change. All of a sudden, we begin to see this thing a little different, don't we? It's not about being perfect. You know one of the things that annoys the devil to no end? You know one of the things that makes Satan matter than anything you could ever imagine in your life? Here's the truth that he doesn't want to get out. You can be sinful. You can be unholy. Yes, Pentecostal holiness person, I said unholy. You can do all kinds of things wrong. You can believe all kinds of things wrong. You can have all kinds of things wrong in your life. But if you understand the power that God has endued his people with, the devil has no power over you. Say, well, pastor, what does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. It means that somebody who's not even in the truth, somebody who doesn't even have this thing like they ought to have this thing and understand this thing like they ought to understand this thing can still cast out devils because they understood the end to which the power was given to the church. Do you follow what I'm telling you? They know what that power is for. That's power over unclean devils. That's power over the enemy. That's power over the works of darkness. They understand that much. A lot of their doctrine may be wrong. A lot of their teaching might be wrong. But they understand that much. God has given the church power over the works of darkness. God has given the church power over the enemy. Because if the enemy can hinder us at every turn, we cannot be an effective witness to the resurrection of Christ. And I tell the truth. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So therefore, part of the end to which we are given power is so that we can walk in victory over all the works of darkness, over all the works of the enemy. Everything Satan tries to throw at us, we can just stomp on it and walk on over it and keep on going because the enemy has no power over us. He doesn't want you to know that. Do you know one of the things Satan will do when you're casting out a demon? You want to know one of the tricks he'll play to try to distract and to convince people that they do not have power over him? Listen to me now, children. You don't know how many times this has happened to people. They'll be casting out a demon, or they'll be coming against a demon in somebody's life, and all of a sudden that demon will remind them of something they recently said or something they recently did that was wrong, that they shouldn't have done. You had an affair with a woman in the church, or you did this, or you cussed, you know, you told your child this, or you told your husband that. This demon knows these things, and all of a sudden the demon starts telling 
the, for lack of a better word, the exorcist starts telling them things that where they have failed, where they have fallen, where they have faltered. What they're trying to do is they're trying to convince you, listen to me, they're trying to convince you that the power of God cannot operate through you because you're less than perfect. But guess what? They're wrong. <laughs> They're wrong. Whenever I've had the devil try a stunt like that with me, I said, yes, sir, you're right. In the name of Jesus, come out of that person. And by God, here they come. Because... I know that that is a red herring. I know they're trying to get me off distracted on something that don't have nothing to do with nothing. My power comes from the indwelling Spirit of God. It's not about me. It's about Him. The Holy Ghost is in me. Devil, I got news for you. It doesn't matter two licks whether I'm perfect or imperfect. It doesn't matter two licks whether I'm right or wrong. It doesn't matter whether I'm able to do this thing exactly the way I'm supposed to do this thing or not. I still have power over you. Oh my Lord. Somebody said, Preacher, is that scriptural? I don't believe that. I don't believe for one minute that that's true. Well, apparently you don't believe the Bible. Because Jesus said, listen to me now. Not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord. Is going to enter in. He said, Some are going to say, But Lord, have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not healed the sick in your name? And what does the Lord say? Sorry, I never knew you. So guess what? The preacher's right. Guess what? The preacher knows what he's talking about. Guess what? I am preaching the Word of God. I am preaching the truth of God's Word. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? You see, we get the power that God has given the church all mixed up. We believe it serves a purpose it doesn't serve at all, and yet at the same time, the true purpose that it serves we don't recognize and we don't appreciate. And because we don't appreciate the true purpose that it serves, we don't experience those benefits. And because we do believe it does something it doesn't do, we become discouraged, despondent, and depressed every time we experience something that suggests to us that, huh, I must not have gotten the Holy Ghost because I'm not able to live perfect. I'm, I'm not constantly doing the right thing. I still find myself able to sin. I still find myself able to fall. I still find myself able to do things and say things that I ought not to be doing and saying. The greatest gift and the greatest benefit of the indwelling Holy Ghost, listen to me, is staying power. When the Spirit of God re resides within us, He helps us, listen to me children, He helps us to always lean on the grace of God, putting no confidence in ourselves, but always staying focused on the perfection, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, which is our possession today by faith. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. In Mark 16, 15 through 19, and he said unto them, speaking of Jesus, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs 
shall follow them that believe. He didn't say they may follow, they might follow, they should follow, they could follow. He said these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. First thing on the list, power over devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Oh, children, I want to tell you something today. The Lord himself demonstrated what power it was that he would later endo uh, the church with. In Luke 4, 28 through 36, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, meaning Jesus, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But he, meaning Jesus, passing through the midst of them, went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word for is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. Oh, children, I want you to understand something today. Our battle today is a spiritual battle. Our mission is a spiritual mission. Our enemy is a spiritual enemy. And our weapons today are spiritual weapons. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul knew better than any Christian in history the realities of spirit-filled living. It's not about being empowered to live above sin or to live perfectly, but rather to be able to effectively witness to the truth of a resurrected Christ through the demonstration and power of God's indwelling spirit. In Romans 7, 14 through 23, the apostle Paul writes, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not? But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, 
For to will is present with me. He says the desire's there for me to do the right thing. He said, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward name, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. This was the Holy Ghost filled man saying this. Paul the Apostle is saying, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. The evil that I'm trying to avoid, that's what I find myself doing. The good that I want to do, I can't find a way to do it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The Apostle Paul, obviously the Holy Ghost ain't there to help you live perfect and holy. No, wrong. We've got that wrong. The power that God has promised the church is for another reason. We shall remain under the influence of sin so long as we live in this human body. But as we allow the Spirit of God to operate through us, listen, we gain victory more and more over the influence of sin. Nothing empowers us personally like feeling and seeing the power of God operate through us and in us. I'm going to tell you that if you... If you ever want to be encouraged to live right and do right, if you ever want to be empowered to live right and do right, just lay hands on somebody and see God heal them. And see if that doesn't all of a sudden give you the, the strength to push a little harder and try a little harder to do this thing right. There is nothing more encouraging, nothing more wonderful than seeing the power of God operate through you. Monte, see, God knew how this thing worked. He said, I don't need to give you power to live victoriously over sin. I don't need to give you power to do right and act right and live right. He said, no, if I give you power over the enemy, if I give you power over sickness, if I give you power to be a witness, in the process of that, you will be encouraged to do the other. See, we live in a world today, preachers think, if I don't preach against it, it ain't going to get fixed. Wrong. Wrong. You don't have to preach against nothing for God to be able to fix it. The problem is you don't believe God's real. You don't believe the Lord is able to take care of his own business. So you think in order for, if there's a problem, if you see people doing things or acting a certain way, if i got to preach against it. That's my job. No, it is not your job. Mm -hmm. It's not your job. Your job is to encourage people to keep the faith. Your job is to encourage people to find a deeper walk with the Lord because the closer you come to Jesus, the more you come to the Lord, the closer your walk with God becomes. Let me tell you something. You'll be shocked at how things you ought not to do just start to fall off. If these preachers spend more time instead of preaching against this and against that, if they spend more time encouraging people to find a deeper, closer walk with the Lord, then they would see the Holy Ghost doing the work. Because funny enough, you can preach against it till the cows come home and people still continue to do it. Haven't you ever noticed that preacher? You preach against it, and you preach against it, and you preach against it, and they still just keep doing it. You know why? You're not letting the Holy Ghost do His job. You're not letting the Lord do what He does best. You think you've got to do God's work for Him. The, the Lord has empowered us by His Spirit for the purpose of fighting, listen, and winning spiritual battles in His name so that the world might know that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he was 
and that he did indeed rise from the dead and ascend into glory. Yet, as the writer Luke says in our primary text today, after the ascension, the Lord continued to work and to do in the earth. But now he does so in and through his people. We are the hands of God in the earth today. We're still human. We're still imperfect. But the object of the power of God is not to demonstrate how wonderful and holy we are, but rather how real and alive our God is. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen.